though there were many positive steps back towards Book of Acts Christianity that were brought about through the Reformation, there was one particular doctrine that was developed by Augustine that was enhanced and built upon by the Reformers. This doctrine we know commonly as predestination. It is also known as election, sometimes known as unconditional election. In order to understand the doctrine of predestination or election, it is important to understand some of the false teachings that existed during the early church. One such teaching is Gnostic dualism. This is from the Greek word gnosis, and it means knowledge. Dualism views the world in terms of opposing forces, that being light and darkness, flesh and spirit, etc. The good God created all things spiritual, that being light, and a demiurge created all things material, that is darkness. Therefore, the material or physical world is bad, and the spirit is good. New Testament writers were already combating Gnostic dualism in their writings. Many writers have concluded that Gnosticism was emerging in the churches in the background of several New Testament books, such as Colossians, Ephesians, the Pastoral Epistles, Peter's Epistles, and Jude, but especially 1 John. Since the material is bad or evil, spirit and soul were separated from flesh in Gnostic thought. This gave rise to heresies related to the incarnation of Christ, for example. One form of Gnosticism may have had a lasting influence on Christian doctrine due to Augustine having studied it for some ten years before converting to Christ. That Gnosticism is Manichaeism or Manichaeism. Scholars are increasingly pointing out the relationship between Manichaeism and Augustine's theories related to God's absolute sovereignty and election or predestination. One scenario works this way. Because matter is inherently evil, then all of man's actions are evil. Therefore, man is incapable of doing good. Man is incapable of doing anything but sin. This naturally leads to a doctrine in which God must regenerate a person before they can choose to respond to the gospel. This is a step beyond Tertullian, who affirmed that, quote, Our entire being was changed from its original wholeness to rebellion against God when Adam fell. Or in the middle of the third century, Cyprian, who insisted that human nature was corrupted through the fall of Adam. Although Augustine experimented with skepticism, Manichaeanism, and Platonism, he had known Christian teachings since childhood because his mother was a Christian. He claimed he was unable to make a decisive step towards full belief. He is known for praying, quote, Grant me chastity, but not yet, unquote. Then at some point, in a way he could only attribute to God's grace, he was made capable of accepting and following Christianity. When he became a theologian, he kept this experience central to his theology. Our systematic theologies that have come about over the years were generally brought about in response to what were perceived to be heresies. This is particularly true when it comes to a man by the name of Pelagius. You see, he didn't believe in the concept of original sin as we come to know it today. So Augustine, in response to many of his teachings, set about to establish the doctrine of predestination or election as we come to know it today.
Because Pelagius was considered to be a heretic, it is difficult to know with certainty exactly what his theology was as it relates to sin and free will. We do have excerpts that are contained in rebuttals that were made against him. It seems as though, however, that Pelagius believed that when a person has chosen to sin, they could have chosen not to sin. To us, this may seem to be common sense, but for the last 1500 years, this has been a controversial point in theology. Augustine countered that everything that man does apart from God's grace is to a lesser or greater degree sin. This means that Augustine believed that all unregenerate people cannot not sin. If they cannot not sin, how can they accept the grace of God and become a believer? Such a step cannot be sin and therefore falls beyond the realm of possibility for fallen man. Augustine's doctrine effectively means that human beings cannot desire God unless God causes them to desire Him. Emphasize the word causes. He believed that God moves the will of man by a, quote, soft violence, unquote. The question then becomes, what about those who do not believe? Do they resist the grace of God? Augustine's theology that eventually morphed into today what we know as Calvinism says, no, they did not resist. For Augustinians and Calvinists, it is impossible to resist God's grace because it logically follows that those who did believe would have done so from their own free will rather than God's grace. From this point forward, the notion of simply responding to God in faith by one's own free will will be considered works in Calvinistic theology. In other words, Augustine's theology, following the Gnostic dualism in Manichaeanism, that all material is evil and therefore incapable of anything but sin, salvation therefore must necessarily be 100% on God's part. We know this as monergism, and nothing on man's part which would imply synergism. This theology agreed with Augustine's experience, but will be challenged repeatedly through the centuries by people who have been derisively labeled as Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. There's an acronym that's worth remembering that helps to describe the five tenets of Calvinism. That acronym is known as TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. It stands for T, the total depravity of man, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and P, the preservation or the perseverance of the saints. Most Christians who are familiar with their Bible but are unfamiliar with the teachings of Calvinism are mortified or at least shocked in their sensibilities when they learn what Calvinism actually teaches. First, the T or total depravity of man suggests that all people are dead towards God in such a way that they are incapable of doing anything but sinning. Their freedom, their freedom of the will that is, is only limited to do things that are sinful. Secondly, unconditional election. This means that God, for reasons known only to Him, elects some to salvation and others to damnation, that is, they are left to continue on in their sins. And he does that without any consultation of any future knowledge of what one may or may not possibly do in response to the gospel. L is limited atonement. This is the belief that Jesus did not, underline the word not, 
die for the sins of the whole world, as the scripture clearly teaches, but only in fact died for the elect. Then we have I for irresistible grace. This is the suggestion that God's grace is not resistible. In other words, when God moves upon a person in grace, they are carried along to do his will, respond to the gospel, and believe in faith. And then finally, P, or perseverance of the saints. This is sometimes called preservation of the saints. The reason why we have this distinction is that the old Calvinists believe that people must repent of their sins and must live a godly life if they're to have any kind of assurance that they may in fact be one of the elect. However, free grace is the teaching that a person does not need to repent of their sins, does not need to live a holy life, but if they will only in fact give an assent of the mind in terms of belief of the gospel that that is sufficient to determine that this person is in fact one of the elect and because they are one of the elect they can never be lost even if they abandon the faith they are still saved the old Calvinists did not believe that they believed that if a person was truly elect they would persevere in righteousness until the end. Modern day proponents of free grace theology have simply taken Calvinism to its logical conclusion. If God has in fact from the foundation of the world elected some to salvation for reasons known only to himself and the rest to damnation for reasons known only to himself the only thing we need to know is who are the elect. Free grace theology proponents basically are suggesting that the way we know who the elect are is who in fact believe on Jesus Christ. If a person simply turns in faith to Jesus Christ, then they are considered, according to those who espouse free grace theology, as one of the elect. Therefore, they can never be lost they are eternally secure. Whether they continue to live for the Lord, whether they repent of their sins, whether they believe in holiness, it makes no difference. They could even abandon the faith and become apostate, and yet still they are the elect, or they are still saved. Again, this is the logical conclusion that Calvinism has been taken to by certain groups in modern society. Understand that there was a group within the churches of England who would not at all have agreed with the doctrines of free grace theology. These people came to be known pejoratively as the Puritans. They believed that the churches ought to represent what Augustine's ideal was of the invisible church within the visible church. Basically meaning that the church needed to be genuine Christians or maybe what they would have called the elect and that ministers ought to be true and capable ministers of the gospel. They shouldn't be people that had other kinds of occupations that were not really theologically based. And because of this fact, they were sort of looked down upon. They were thought of as troublemakers. And from that group came another group that we've come to know as separatists. These were people who basically were not willing to wait around while the church was being reformed but rather they separated and started churches of their own. Small churches at first, few in number, but they begin to grow over a period of time. The Puritans were concerned that masses of people were attending meetings on Sunday and even partaking of the Lord's Supper, but were not even right with God. A 1593 Edinburgh, Scotland register entry reads, What a pitiful thing it is to come into a meeting with one or two thousand souls and not be able to find four or five who can give an account of their faith in such a way that it could be said, quote, This is a Christian man. He is a child of the church. Unquote. 
How can such depravity plague the church? It all comes down to ministers fulfilling their duties before God and man. When the ministers are sinful and unrepentant, they are not likely to enforce important regulations in the churches. Consequently, men came to the Lord's Supper in a sinful state. And since the authority to deal with such issues was in the hands of bishops, the Puritans were helpless to correct these errors. They complained that the bishops' courts were excommunicating good men for minor offenses while allowing adulterers and thieves to go unpunished. As far as the Puritans were concerned, the bishops were obstacles to reformation. When Puritan John Udall rebuked a bishop saying, You are in league with hell and have made a covenant with death, they executed him. We must bear in mind that for centuries, church and state were one united entity, not divided as they are today. While the majority of Puritans believed that they could utilize the government to cleanse the church from its shortcomings, a minority group was not prepared to wait they took an altogether different approach. This minority, though keeping themselves subject to the government, believed that the English church, like the Roman Catholic Church, was beyond reform. Their approach was to start new churches in which the wicked and the willfully ignorant were excluded. As early as the 1560s, there were a few groups that started to assemble. For example, in 1580, Robert Brown started a church and was the first to defend the practice of separating from the Church of England. Those who subscribed to this approach were called separatists. Although Brown later recanted of his views, those who separated were also called Brownists. The separationists themselves preferred to be called Brethren of the Separation. Although the number of separatist churches was small in the beginning, they learned how to function independent of the Anglican hierarchy. This allowed them to test novel concepts many years before other Puritans that chose to remain in the Church of England. The non-separatists did make progress in various places throughout the country. Some were allowed to choose their own pastors for their local churches. This gave weight to their argument that errors within the Church of England were not a sufficient reason for separating from it. The non-separatists accused the separatists of schism. The separatists countered by claiming that they were not guilty of schism because the Church of England was no church at all. They based this claim on two grounds. First, the Church of England lacked the essential characteristic of a true church, that is, a means of employing church discipline and the power to exclude unworthy members. Second, it had never been a church because it had been improperly established with improper people. This meant that they did not consider the Church of England to be governed or attended by true Christians. A true Christian, according to the separatists, was a person that demonstrated evidence of conversion. Unlike the Anabaptists that had requirements for joining the church, the separatists charged John Calvin with sweeping saints, sinner, and the ignorant alike into the church at Geneva. They likened the practice to the wholesale conversion of the realm of England after Mary's death, when Papist and Protestant were all brought into the church. They insisted that this was no way to form a church. The separatists believed that a church must begin voluntarily with persons worthy of worshiping God. These persons must not only believe, but also strive to live by God's word. In order to enforce this ideal, all church members were required to submit to church discipline. This could not be done by government compulsion or by constraint of sinners, but by the free consent of believers. These reforms were served to form a church of real believers rather than force everyone indiscriminately and by government decree into the church. The separatists had three requirements for admission into their churches. First, profession of faith. Second, subscription to the covenant. And third, righteous living. As the separatist churches formed, they insisted that they be independent of one another and not subject to a higher church authority. 
This was the forerunner of congregationalism. They were to enjoin themselves to a covenant agreement. They were to be supported by voluntary contributions and not by tithes or by contributions of the civil government. These churches could form with as little as two or three persons, but no more than could reasonably assemble in one place. In their worship services, they stressed spontaneity, even allowing members to give a prophecy after the sermon. These prophecies were short, extemporary sermons. The separatists had many other beliefs, but this brief sketch will suffice for our purpose of understanding how their influence contributed to our quest for Book of Acts style evangelism. In 1620, a group of separatists that had traveled to Holland boarded the Mayflower and traveled to what is now Massachusetts. Understand that these people came with a desire to see what Edwin S. Morgan would term as the visible saints living out the life of the invisible church right here in the New World. Ten years later, in 1630, a group of Puritans traveled across the ocean to the New England colonies in order to help perpetuate this notion of a city upon a hill. Understand in those days that in order to be a member of a church, you had to be able to give what was known as a conversion narrative. This was basically an explanation of how a person truly came to Christ. If you could give a conversion narrative that was convincing, that people would believe, then you were considered a visible saint. In other words, one of the elect. If you could not give this conversion narrative, then you could not join the church. This had serious implications. For one, in order to vote in those particular townships, you had to be a member of a church. So you can see how this would be fraught with all kinds of difficulties. Nevertheless, we have returned at this juncture in history to the notion that a person, in order to truly become a member of the church, has to have undergone genuine conversion. And they need to be able to articulate that conversion in a way that's meaningful and convincing. John Calvin emphasized that it is impossible in this world to know whether or not a person was truly one of God's elect. Nevertheless, he did furnish a list of things in which a person could look at as criteria to determine their chances, if you will. Understand that this was a time very unlike our time today. In modern times, it's not unusual at all for a minister to tell someone that they're saved if they go through a series of steps, such as saying the sinner's prayer or uh, something of that nature. Nevertheless, in these days, and truly up until about the last 100 years, no one was ever told that they were saved. It was left up to the individual to have the assurance in themselves that they were saved. As a matter of fact, conversion could ever only be thought of as hopeful. Therefore, you will see in writings relating up to the 1900s, the language of hopeful conversion. Hopeful conversion. It was the word that was used for hundreds of years in place of what we say today as saved. If an anxious sinner would have asked the Puritans, what must I do to be saved? They would have discovered two basic camps of people within Calvinism during the late 1500s and 1600s. One group believed that God regenerates people spontaneously and without any effort on their part. The second group believed a person could prepare themselves to receive grace. In other words, though a person cannot earn grace, they can prepare for grace. 
During this period of preparation, one is subjected to the Word of God in sermons, prayer, and worship with the hope that Holy Spirit conviction of sin, humiliation before God, and fear for one's own soul as a condition will result. For strict Calvinists, this approach implied a human element in salvation and should be utterly rejected as synergism. Some denounce the approach as Arminianism. Nevertheless, as we will discover, preparationism, though denounced by strict Calvinists, was an important step back towards Book of Acts-style evangelism. In our next entry, we will examine the Puritan concept of conversion, how some believe that there needed to be a time of preparation, while others believe that regeneration was spontaneous. This is our series that I've entitled, Televangelicalism, How We Lost the Gospel and How to Get It Back.